very warm welcome. Actually, the room's a bit chilly, so apologies for that. But a very warm welcome to our uh, final Institute for Environmental Futures seminar of 2022. Uh, we've had a few technical issues because Hightech isn't here today, but we haven't been able to live stream over YouTube, but I'll be sharing the link uh, to a recorded meeting um, at some point over the next few days. So thanks for bearing with us on that one. Um, my name is Emma Stockley. I'm the seminar series convener for the Institute. Um, I'm also a PhD student here at Leicester. Um, so just to let you know, before I introduce our speaker for today, um, we'll be, um, uh, there'll be the opportunity for coffee at three o'clock. So you're very welcome to join us to continue the discussion then. And also just to make you aware that we're actually recording today's session as well. Um, so just a quick notice, our next seminar is in the new year on the 17th of January, where we'll be welcoming environmental artist Rebecca Chesney and Professor Mark Williams here from the University of Leicester and they will be discussing patterns of change in the Anthropocene so that's going to be really exciting so do keep an eye out for our newsletter and um, instructions on how to register for that seminar but without further ado I will introduce Professor Athena Prakridiani. Uh, Athena is Professor in Media and Communications at the University of Leicester she is currently Principal Investigator for the European Commission Horizon 2020 project, DigiGen, the impact of technological transformations on the digital generation, leading the work on ICT and the transformation of civic participation 2019-2022. Her primary scholarship is a sustained inquiry into how digital networks have transformed conflict, security, activism and geopolitics, Using diverse digital methods such as netnography and various forms of data analytics, in collaboration with scholars from political communication, history, sociology, and computer science, she has led research on the impact of digital communication technologies on ideology, governance, and organization. Um, so, Athena, over to you, and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, all right. I think that uh, it has like this thing that I'm just mindful of, of uh, kind of the, is the way it is. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for being here. I thought there were, there were more than three people, it was like a Christmas miracle. So I think you kind of made it happen, the Christmas miracle. And uh, um, so what I want to do today is I'm going to uh, talk about how, how through that project of actually finished the 30th of November, but of course, it never really finishes. Uh, this is uh, the Horizon 2020 we had here in Leicester. Uh, we led the, uh, the work on uh, ICT and civic participation. And, and then our, this is how, how I go into a Tishman Rebellion, personally. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the project called Climate Simple that the Institute of Environmental Futures funded uh, in March. So I'm going to show you some of the work we have done since then uh, on, on the basis of that funding. So uh, here, I have, uh, the, here I have the team <laughs> so that is involved in the Climate Info uh, project. Uh, and we're really, really lucky because not only we have uh, brilliant early career scholars and PhD students involved from, uh, from Chile, uh, uh, like Sebastian, who is here, a PhD student, uh, Renata Tario, uh, who was a visiting student here and she uh, and Sebastian worked on the uh, on Instagram and um, collecting uh, images for us uh, and a sort of called uh, um, rebellion exile visualities that I'm going to talk about and uh, that became part of the project of climate disinformation uh, later on as well and in that there's people like David Smith working on disinformation uh, Maria Rovisco, who is from Leeds, and, and Chris Morgan from Sheffield, who used to be in Leicester, our excellent colleague that work on the um, visual communication, the catching communication. Just some of the people, Bernard Fortner, who is in the Institute as well, uh, leading the, the climate, uh, I think it's called Climate Resistance Exclusion, Atlantic Communities, or something like that. I don't know what it's called these days since uh, we first worked on it. And then uh, Camis. Uh, who's a PhD student here that works in data analytics for the project. There's many sort of wonderful people, I've just mentioned some of them. Um, and I'm gonna like mention what kind of work each, each of, um, of his uh, uh, colleagues is doing for the project. The, 
experience uh, had, I think it's a wonderful experience to see so many expert beings like coming together to talk about uh, something specific. And it, it, sometimes it gets difficult to, to get to speak a common language, but uh, it, you, it's getting there that is uh, the fun and that I think uh, inspires more uh, dialogue, let's say the dialectic that we're here to um, work on. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, how do I, yeah. So, Oh, this is very interesting because if I go there, then I'm not. Anyway, um, so yeah, so um, I thought I would just uh, start uh, in kind of a basic way because I realize that people here from different disciplines that haven't even heard about, uh, you know, international environmental communication on digital networks, online or hybrid or polymedia, transmedia, whatever you want to call it these days. People call it different things. Actually, uh, exist. Uh, uh, and I think for the problem has been, um, I think uh, that historically, uh, since the 1980s, where, where you have like the field kind of emerging, not the online one, the general one, right? Uh, you have the problem of um, focus, the focus has been, and we know this also because of the experience of the GCRF and how everybody kind of work in that area also in this university in, in recent years, but that program is over, the OBA and all that. But um, the focus has been on Western industrialized countries, and this has only really changed. Um, I, I don't think I'm the only one that says this in the literature in the last decade in particular, when you have more focus, more PhD projects, more research done in the global south. And, in terms of um, the communication, talking about environmental communication, I'm not talking about everything, right? Just to clarify this. So um, then the other problem is that environmental communication scholars who we all respect very much, they, um, they haven't really go into, let's say, the social media and online communication uh, kind of uh, story, right? So this, this has been more so probably since about 2014, 2015, that is a, kind of a bigger interest in this area, right? So they're catching up, so to speak. Um, then we have the, um, the general debate has been quite a boring one. Um, I mean, it has been more interesting in the debates in people that do generally, let's say, digital activism or digital communication. I'm a little bit more interesting than that one, but I'm gonna tell you what that one is. And that one is has optimists basically saying that um, online debate, like using social media uh, is effective in terms of um, sort of making uh, more uh, collaborations, making scientific data available very fast, uh, also uh, mapping environmental issues uh, and um, it's a source for um, information for many people and the way to deliver in a more modern way. So it has like all these things that we all know are great, right? And in some countries, I would not say which ones, we all know, hopefully it's about bypass and sensor to see as well in the case where um, sort of uh, not just environmental, but other types of data is not, um, is not available due to censorship, uh, government, government censorship. There are cases where you also have corporate censorship and, and white uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> The, you have that as well, but that's another matter. But anyway, it is good for that thing. And of course, the pessimists would say all that the pessimists uh, started to say probably from about 2014 uh, or 2013, when we had like an avalanche of revelation, uh, revelations uh, after WikiLeaks, Snowden, and so on, um, which uh, shows that we have um, uh, disinformation, misinformation, government securitization, um, you have problems in terms of polarization, political bubbles, etc. Um, and also that you have um, inequalities of participation um, and knowledge gaps, particularly from um, because you have like a domination of knowledge production anyway uh, in the global north and all that kind of story. So that and gets reproduced in different networks, it's not that. <laughs> you know, your Twitter and you can conquer the world or something like that. And certainly not these days. Um, so then you have, uh, what, what, what are they focusing on? And I'm sorry, I'm turning like this, it's very for me too. Um, what is the focus on, on uh, strategies, successes and failures? 
Um, but what we've seen in terms of online, online communication in particular, it, it focuses on civil society actors, um, not so much on the communication by the government and corporates. So there is a, like an emphasis there, which for me is very good because I work in this area. And what they're looking at is discourse, ideology, organization, and so on. And then you have a variety, a variety of techniques, quantity, quality, uh, text mining, social network analysis, digital methods, and so on and so forth, which is like very normal uh, because if you're a digital sorry, it's a science uh, researcher, then you know you would be doing that kind of those kind of methods anyway. And then you have uh, the 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 notion, the scholarship that talks about online media producing more alternative content and giving people a voice, whatever. But this has opened the door to an aggressive um, kind of, uh, let's say, aggressive modes of communication online where, where experts are attacked. And the problem with that is that you have um, uh, the trolling like <laughs> of uh, scientists, of, of people like that, and you have think tanks uh, that are um, climate denialist uh, think tanks uh, with heavy funding that are actually uh, using this information, the clicks, this information as in coordinated you know, kind of behavior with misinformation, meaning that you um, propagate uh, this information without knowing that it is, like kind of just uh, broad, uh, broadly to say. Um, now, the issue is that although there, is, there was this optimism, certainly until like 2013, 2014, um, and not so much in the general paragraph of the 2016 Brexit and US elections and so on, uh, you have the problem um, of that, and if you see, and I'll show some of that, the, the legacy and traditional media are still powerful in, in this situation. So it's not that, you know, you can conquer, as you said, like the world through hashtag activism necessarily, it's quite rare that you have like the disruptive um, uh, social media virality uh, so to say, as some colleagues call it. Uh, and then the other thing is that you have, uh, because civil societies are so active, that's why, uh, especially in the global south, that's why they now studied far more than they used to be studied, but perhaps. And then you have, as I said, these think tanks that are problematic. So some of the communication scholarship is focusing to them. Now to finish uh, sort of this general story, um, the, the, there has been a recent, more traditionally, you have like more generalism focused kind of uh, analysis, like right? the communication analysis and so on. But because it has been the decline and generalism, we don't have time for, but it's very interesting. Uh, you have uh, the problem of now some of the research in that area has left the journalism story, has gone to the influencer story, the celebrity activism and, and this kind of stuff. And also, um, uh, the, in terms of the environmental social movements, the critiques have been that for a long time, even since the 80s and before then, actually, that uh, they cannot incorporate the uh, issues in their movements that have to do with race and class or social location and, and so on. And this is how then environmental justice emerged as a movement um, to, to just oppose to the more traditional uh, environmental social movement. Now there's a whole story there <laughs> we don't have time for, but I'm sure if you're interested, you can find out about it. Now, the, 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 what happens to social media is the differences and polarizations inside, let's say the broader environmental movement, right? They, they, they accelerate and they ac accentuate. So you have like this polarization being reproduced, or let's say, to this coffee, some polarization are reproduced sometimes in a polarized way on, on social media, right? Okay, so uh, so we have like this project, and of course, with this project, you, uh, we kind of sat down uh, somewhere in Oslo in uh, I think this uh, October or November like 2018, and while we're sitting there designing sort of this application that we got the result in 2019 in the summer somewhere. Uh, I'm saying this because it's quite important. I was sitting there not knowing at the same time Greta Thunberg was doing her thing. All I was thinking about was blazing me uh, or like yeah, a little bit of a grand academic, how do I not get to 
uh, do a lot of electrical applications because it also had the focus on children and young people. So I thought, oh, between 16 and 18, you, you don't need to stay, they, they, they can talk to you on their own account, right? They, they, I don't need time or permission to interview them, right? So that's why I have this focus from the very beginning. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do 16 and 18 city participation because that is an interest of mine, this area, and then I don't have to bother with other things. Things a uh, little bit I know, of course, that would be another study that was related, that was kids 19 to 15. So, anyway, I have to uh, do an ethics application on that as well, which is interesting. After you do ethics application about children, you can actually do ethics application about anything, I think. Um, so, anyway, we have these partners in uh, Estonia, Katrin Wiedeberg, and in Greece, and it's Bastana and behind those people, including Nestor, here we have uh, 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 you know, a, a, a rather like uh, large team here in Leicester. I have wonderful colleagues. Uh, Bernard was uh, in on that, Guy Levine, and Michael Dunning, my friend of the Cosmo and Morte. We had loads of uh, uh, people um, on that. But what happened as projects go is that you're thinking, okay, uh, what would be very interesting is supposing that was the, pro the project actually kicked out in December 2019, right? And we had uh, our package, our key package, which was a city participation, had an ethnography, which is an online content uh, analysis, online observation, and online interviews. It was all online, but that was not the problem. The problem was the pandemic came and recruiting participants became, participants became uh, extremely difficult. Whoever has had those experiences, like excruciating, yeah? Uh, but we still managed to do it. But what I was thinking about that, uh, so we did these reports. Uh, they are on the Digigen website. Uh, so the first one is about uh, looking at uh, this ethnographic study I'm going to talk about in the three countries. The second was doing digital storytelling workshops uh, with the help of Dai Levine, uh, who's an expert in that technique, uh, with uh, uh, basically teenagers, like 18 year, 15 to 18 year old. Uh, and these storytelling workshops that happen online and it was about what challenge inspired their, their participation, right? And the final one was just, just doing comparative policy that must analyze about, for about 45 documents uh, in total. Now, what, what we wanted to understand uh, in terms of, uh, of the, the ethnographic study is basically why do these participants engage in, uh, in, uh, in civil, civil participation? Uh, and what are the similarities and differences in comparison with the countries, and then how do we do it, right? It's very simple questions, right? And what, um, what was interesting uh, is that was, I kind of like, because I was like the PR and the thing, I said, look, why don't we do what's happening right now, right? What, what are the dominant uh, movements potentially that young people can participate? And what happened there was in Greece, uh, there was like uh, mobilizing against gender based violence. We had the latent, like a delayed uh, or a movement of 10 years after India. India had one uh, for circumstances that are particular to the historical context in Greece, and then anti policing, anti police brutality. And then in Estonia, what was more of interest there, the young people in LGBTQ plus <clears throat> and Black Lives Matter. Well, here in Leicester, what I chose is uh, was BLM and, uh, and how to do also. We're taking something about Leicester and interviewing people in Leicester about the process here, which we've done um, an event about, like less than those in Leicester lockdown. Maybe you have the chance to see, but it, it's online if you haven't. And then the how I thought this is very was that I decided I wanted to um, focus on uh, like children, sorry, uh, children, adolescents, rather. Um, and people, we agreed that to make it more interesting, we would focus yes on teenagers, but we would also interview people that were also reminiscing about their activism, right, and the development of that. And that's how we got away with um, interviewing very, some of the very different people I'm going to talk about uh, now and what they said. And also, we captured the tension between street rebellion and the street rebellion youth, which was a, a wonderful thing to, to kind of capture at the time. So now uh, I'm going to really talk only about um, only about uh, XR today, but you can read the report about BLM and the, the story of it, about Leicester. So one of the things is that, um, I mean, and a participant uh, told me this, uh, who is in XR, is that it's a broad church. Right, right. 
is that the logical spectrum is not as narrow as people think. It's not like hugging keepings on the left or whatever. It's, it's very, very broad. Uh, there are conservationists in that movement as well, for example. But also, uh, there's a participant that, that said that we have disagreements about strategy and tactics, what is nonviolent, what is considered nonviolent, uh, uh, you know. And, and he also <laughs> makes a comment about uh, labor. He's, he was a labor activist before he joined in XR, for example. Um, XR Youth was um, uh, the, the activist uh, I lived with there. It was very, very interesting because at some point, XR Youth, um, because of disagreements about the Hitler action, uh, like uh, 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 occupied uh, a meeting by the main XR or central XR, whatever you want to call it. And they, they went and buzzed in the meeting with cinnamon bands and said, here we are, we want a bigger voice in this movement. And they were like, well, what are you doing? They're like, well, we're using the occupation tactics you have got them, right? And that's a moment where HIV actually uh, attempts to, uh, to kind of like intervene, have a bigger voice in the movement. And they would also disagree about the crypto action, which when I said in, in some other way uh, and so on. Um, now, um, the other thing, and this is an example um, that I want to give uh, from uh, 17 uh, in exile youth uh, activist uh, who said that I was a Tory member, but I left the Tory party because of the police he did, and so on. So it's not like everybody in exile is kind of like this uh, radical, uh, you know, like leftist and so on. Um, now, some of the problems, uh, so I want to talk a bit about the, what really struck me during the interviews. One had to do with the professional background of the people uh, we interviewed, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I should have uh, included the table of participants here, um, of the people that were interviewed. Um, the prof their professional background was heavily in branding, marketing, like this is the kind of this is what, when you see all these, uh, the logos and the posters and things, and we'll show you some of that of Excel, you can see that some of these are like truly professionally done. And it's very, very interesting that production, how, what happens there, of course, uh, and so on. And there were people that were either maybe redundant or, uh, you know, something happened. They had a, a stroke of uh, kind of like, I want to do something else in this life or disappointment that they got in Excel and start producing. But the professional background, were very, very interesting was in these areas, some of them in communication in particular, which is very helpful uh, for a movement. Uh, the other thing that is interesting is about training, that they didn't have to uh, go through training about what to do with police, because there's a tactic, of course, by XA about arrest, getting arrested, right? And there's the criticism about that in relation to, oh, only what white people can be arrested, but there has been a criticism against XA, this is a white middle class, um, movement that is not in touch with the global south and all sorts of things like that and then you have the mentoring that we noticed uh, and the example was uh, we interviewed the uh, strategy youth striker leader in Lyon in France uh, with my uh, colleague at some point uh, Jacob Matthews and he uh, like that activist said that they were influenced by an exa uh, they were a kind of youth striker that were at they were actually influenced by um, uh, XR activists that were in the 70s. And, and the interesting thing about the XR activists in the 70s, of course, was that she evolved from being uh, part of much, much earlier movements in the 60s and so on and so forth. Um, so the reason we interviewed in France was to get a link into kind of like the, some of the organizational staff. Uh, and then we focused, of course, in the UK. That was the premise of, of the project, anyway, that we we'll have like a UK, Sonia, Greek kind of thing. Now, um, so, so I think that the, the general hope uh, of, of this kind of study with the three countries by comparison was to contribute in several areas. I mean, the first one, okay, this assistant sit now. This term, I don't like using it, but it's in kind of a broad use, right? I don't like using it because the citizens have been that you exclude, uh, it's already based on this exclusion, right? You're a citizen of one or the other. And I don't like it, but in terms of what this assistant is used in the, in the literature, um, is this kind of thing um, access, commerce, communication, um, health and well being, security, safety. And recently, 
thanks, um, thanks to Cardiff and the data justice lab, I think although I've been working before uh, that point as well, we have the question of data justice and um, digital inequalities being thrown into that kind of area, especially um, inequalities that are beyond uh, just the access question, right? And, and skills and competencies question. And then we have this activism scholars, which is where I come from. Um, you can say like, what is that? Well, that's in, uh, well, how I understand this activism is when you have um, non, uh, okay, let's see, uh, non-governmental outside the formal political system activism by uh, non-state actors uh, and civil society actors. Now, that's how I see it. So grassroots activists, let's say, uh, for um, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, I would see them as part of the story, but not the people that do the official PR, if it makes any sense, just to give a, a, a broad definition, not, not the party activists, the like party party established institutional kind of activists. Now, the other thing that we were hoping, and I think we will contribute to, um, is this kind of uh, political youth culture in each specific country and how it compares to each other. Now, um, I'm going to get like to kind of like more specific stuff. Now, this is uh, the boring bit, I guess. Although, for people that are interested in kind of innovation in terms of communication, is very interesting in the case of XR uh, because you, you have like, okay, they have this basic uh, uh, differentiation where you have the media messaging group that is doing the external um, coordination of communication about XR. And then you have the, uh, uh, which is, um, uh, then, then you have the internal communication, uh, which was used to be called a tech group, and then became digital group. The whole point uh, that is very interesting here, although you have the very common use uh, of external publicity like uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and whatever, there are uh, internal organization you know, features of communication, such as Glassroad, which is a commercial application where um, XR activists uh, go, and, and this is where uh, the role of the groups, everything that has to do with what everybody is doing is on that platform. And I, I will show you a sneaky screenshot that I took during a meeting, and we're training themselves uh, in a minute. And then you have like um, a base camp, this is how they started from, but then when it is 8,000 users, it couldn't scale up, so they had to go somewhere else, and then they went to Mattermost. What is very important, I think, here is one, the innovation. Uh, two, that, that the more organized news are, they understand issues of, of surveillance. So they left WhatsApp for Telegram and, um, and a Signal as well, uh, and, and especially after a point, right? Uh, now, an example of the external looking things, and I followed, uh, I don't know how many pages of these uh, over the years. Uh, so this is an example, right, of, so for instance, here is defined as a community group, uh, that is the Cambridge one. Uh, here is an environmental organization, non-profit, but they have different definitions, and you have like different type of um, kind of like advertising uh, and, and organizing. Now, this is quite important, the introduction to XR. This is, this is how people that want to join the movement go and they might go to physical meeting during the pandemic and went to an online meeting. Um, uh, uh, and this is how it, it's called the talk, right? So maybe somebody has probably have been to the talk. Uh, if not, I have been. Um, it, it's very visual and it has a lot of images of uh, an explanation about the challenges of the uh, uh, um, climate emergency and so on. Um, now, I want to talk particularly about that because I thought that was quite impressive because of course, the first time we see live streaming ever, in fact, is the globalization movement in Seattle. Um, that's back in 1999, right? And this is the first time we have this challenge of two mainstream media, I suppose, that are not covering protests. But from that to what is happening here, right here in this particular protest, you can see uh, this woman that is uh, holding you know, her mobile phone, maybe it's an XR one, <laughs> just joking, but she's interviewed by somebody else uh, uh, about uh, like her reporting life from the protest, so to speak. 
Then here, there's an effort after the George uh, Floyd murder uh, by police in the US that, that created like um, an assemblage of, of protests uh, uh, around the world that you, you, you were there for that. And uh, you have like this effort to get climate justice and racial justice on the same agenda. And in fact, you have uh, participation. And then you have something other, rather that is interesting up there. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but you have sign language, right? Here's some of these talks so of this effort to, um, uh, to broad. And then there's two guys. This one is on a tree and he's like uh, reporting from the tree. Uh, so, so this is the green thing on top of, of, the top of the tree. And I think this is the kind of techniques that uh, uh, will also very organized with itself that we don't see. Uh, in other movements in the UK, in any case. Now, that is very interesting, but let's not make a screenshot. Um, so basically, how it is organized, you have like the circles, you have like, uh, that have a specific job. This one, for example, systems and culture, you have the rebel hive or whatever. Then you have, a, 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 each person has a role. This role is decided by consent and, and it's a very specific uh, thing that this person needs to do. When we say decide by consent is that uh, all decisions in itself are decided by consent. So you have to say that something harms what you have to the movement and why for uh, for it, for an action or something to not go ahead. Now this can get very tricky for itself uh, because we did that kind of by consent model to, to get away from the consensus occupied, call it the model of occupied, right? But this creates other problems. Uh, for example, the, the cube, sorry, the underground um, in London, that action was criticized because there was a, a group that wanted to do another one, but they disrupted the morning workers going to the work in the underground and all that. The exam was criticized about that because it, um, okay, hold on, because uh, it was criticized because look, like there's a hundred plus people going and you're like privileged and you're doing this action, blah, 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 blah. But it went ahead because it respect the principles of Excel, which is no longer direct action because I'm separating read them. And no one, like, although there was opposition, there was no convincing them that this was not the kind of movement. So it went ahead. So this is an example of this kind of problem. And then you have the other problems are about duplications of road that can happen as well. During the pandemic, we started trying to try to restructure, and, and the complaints were it's too slow, this model of decision making is too slow to restructure, a lot of other movements are structured. Uh, so this restructure of movements in the pandemic is a very interesting area that uh, people I think should look uh, into. And I did say a little bit about uh, uh, organizational innovation. What to say is that the from the point that we saw publicly itself suddenly like bursting in April 2019, I think, like in, in common knowledge, there was a lot of prior organizational work uh, going on. So it didn't just come out of nowhere. And the other thing about organization, uh, the organizational model that was proposed in the topic is called holacracy, and it was to avoid sort of more hierarchical and inflexible and dominated by white men, blah, 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 kind of thing, right? which is a, a very fair criticism, it's kind of from the 1960s, and we can talk about this for ages, it's a fair criticism. The problem has been that the holacracy model itself has its own problems. And um, one activist said uh, uh, that, yes, we did this because of sexualness or that must power, etc. cetera, uh, but horizontal movements of 20, 30 years, but it's been extremely successful, he says, to create a member society that can create strategic coherence and inspiration. So that still has problems. And the person that uh, agreed to actually let me publicize their interview with the ETO, with Jacob Matthews, uh, was George Roger Hallam, one of the key founders of Extreme Rebellion. He carried that interview at the meta, not the meta as in the platforms, as in the meta, as in the Varoufakis uh, outlet. Uh, uh, that, that the post-capitalist thing. So the, one of the most interesting things that he said was that social media is like heroin. You get on a high very quickly and then, you know, nothing happens with a very interesting comment. Uh, but also he has got a lot of, uh, in a lot of trouble uh, because of his um, uh, sort of uh, leadership, leadership style. I've asked him about this in the interview. He has things to say about it and um, uh, himself, the interesting thing was his own ideologization as a post-process, 
uh, of being a, a teenager against the, uh, you know, uh, in the war movement, and then uh, what he wanted to do is based on Peach policy, direct action there to, to change university policy. And unfortunately, he wasn't very successful uh, in that. And then, of course, he's involved uh, with uh, the uh, Ben and Pink party. <laughs> And then, like lots of other things, uh, more more recently, and he's he's part of the movement, but there were uh, issues, right? Uh, he says the movement I helped found is taking over by the middle class in the global north. It's like the criticism that he has made um, uh, himself. Okay, from the whole project, including the um, the three countries, that the that, uh, because this is where you got been roughly about sixty five. Independent views, you have the online material, you have the online observation, and so on. Uh, so it's by no means to extrapolate for the whole universe, but some of the things that we participate we, we observed uh, that is key is that uh, when you have members of less organized movements, uh, they will rely more on commercial platforms and, and so on to organize, communicate, coordinate, and so on. Uh, in this, uh, you might have more intergenerational mentoring. We saw that uh, clearly actually in Leicester in, uh, as well. You have uh, what is important, family, life, world experience, but also triggering events. In, in Greece and the UK, we have a highly polarized political environment, Brexit, Brexit and all that. You, you can see that uh, uh, in, this, in this kind of context, uh, the, the participants, the young people, let's say, uh, that were interviewed, they are more um, mistrustful, uh, mistrustful, sorry, uh, they don't trust the uh, platforms, they don't trust the governments. And, and that is like consistent across. While in Estonia, it's a different matter. They will tell you, oh, what challenges me? I don't have enough time. Maybe school should give me time to do this participation stuff. Or, you know, like it's a different ballgame because the, the, the historical political context and the different governments in these countries is, is, is very different. Uh, the media system is lot more plural, plural, too pluralistic than, than it is uh, here in Greece, and, and the, the story can go. Uh, but the trigger events is very interesting because all the, uh, the people that we work with on the digital storytelling technique, but they produce their own stories, like three or five minute stories, and we show them how to do it, and then they did it. They all talked about, um, in Greece and the UK, about uh, violence, triggering events that were about violence. Uh, policing, uh, uh, policing again in Nigeria, like it was um, the comments were about uh, racial justice and very much so in the UK. Uh, in Greece was the anti-fascist kind of movement and, and protests that were part of protests against uh, the Golden Dawn and the trials against the attacks uh, of uh, uh, gay activists, uh, Zakostopoulos and so on and so forth. So you can see like actually uh, that this can get the um, uh, quite quite interesting. Now this gets me to how at some point I think this March uh, this year, yeah. Uh, so the Keiko asked me like, what would you do, like you know, in terms of a project for the institute? And I said, well, we can do something about climate disinformation. And then already we had started work working the previous months with uh, Renata. Uh, when she came from Brazil here to, to visit me uh, on this uh, Instagram visual communication. And I, I asked her to collect specific uh, handles and things for the COP26. So this, this, has, uh, this project has an, uh, a focus on COP26 and the, the two weeks and the, that time frame period, right? And what we want to, to ask about is, of course, dominant actors, what are the networks, what are the frames of resistance, what are the, the climate um, skepticism or disinformation down in communities, are activists fighting disinformation, you know, that kind of thing. And then uh, what can we learn by analyzing this, getting that analytics, both from uh, Twitter and then also from uh, co both qualitative and quantitative analyses um, and so on. So this is uh, the baby of Sebastian, who is here, who are you, yes. And Renata together. So this is like all the groups that uh, I uh, uh, I asked them to co to collect from Instagram. Uh, then some of them said, "No, the ones remain there. The, 
like about 800, but about 900 that we took out for duplication. And then there was like, sorry about the very small letters, the connotative and the denot denotative kind of what basically different styles of of, uh, of communication and what uh, the what the person posted on Instagram from the Christian Rebellion uh, groups, all these different groups, Birmingham, Bristol, Goldsmith, Leicester, Manchester, Do Solidarity, all these kind of different groups. What, what are they trying to achieve? What are the, the strategies using these images, right? Are they for just to, to show protests? Are they to mobilize people? Are they to recruit people? Tell the public a specific message? Is it all about fear and panic? Or is this hope there in the communication? That kind of thing. What is the visual? context. So now I think you are on the third test of reliability to get us some kind of, uh, so we have the code book, you have got the third one to see what, so that's more the quantitative uh, thing. And we're hoping to basically uh, uh, like code it in a way that we then helps us uh, to, with, the, um, uh, with the individual images that are more independent or whatever. So, so now, so imagine like there's a and there are five, all these files with the different groups inside. There are like different images for each one. I'm just like showing you a little bit about the work. And an example that, uh, I mean, these are my, my favorite images. Other people in the project have different ones. We have like a workshop to discuss like the different type of imagery. Uh, and I, I, it's, it seems to me I do like the ones that are a little bit more kind of like flamboyant. Like here in Australia, we have the color that we used also for the concept of the stone. Uh, I like sort of more costume based protest type of imagery. This is this one, even though it looks like they get the squid game, uh, kind of uh, lettering, or, um, you know, this kind of more festival, carnival less kind of uh, pro protest type, type things uh, is the ones I do like. But if you look at um, the, there are some. And, and it's good that we have this and work there and in our team from Central is the cultural communication kind of um, differences in how images are uh, created by XR activists, XR billion activists in the different countries. Uh, so this is an example from Bristol, that's Bristol specific. Uh, and you can see this is a certain type of, of thing that they are sharing. This is just a, a one part uh, with a big emphasis on costume, on, or a party or not party, uh, like festival kind of atmosphere uh, and that kind of like thing. Whilst, um, and I'm being very general here, uh, Christian mentioned that uh, some of these type of, uh, you know, like the coloring, the, the colors that are chosen and all that are specific to uh, visual culture in um, um, South Korea, I was afraid I'm gonna sing North Korea. <laughs> I've done it before. So you have like this type of thing that is very interesting that that uh, uh, Christian as an Asian, the Asian kind of uh, uh, communication uh, has kind of talked to us about, right? And it's something that we would like to explore. Um, and then this is another thing. So if you look at the previous two and you see kind of what XR in Uganda is saying, right? you can see there's a difference. They are like quite obvious also in how posters and things are produced, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and what the place emphasis on, uh, and, and how like the whole visual communication feels. Now we have it because like this, um, this is like I guess like about a six month now kind of project. And we didn't get ethics until May, so it's like very early. But I thought I would show it to you to say that we do have this. It had very much databases, people are interested in, in, in accessing it. Um, and then, then we have the, uh, like, thanks to the funding from the Institute, we're all grateful. We also have the a research assistant that went and interviewed um, a climate journalist uh, or environmental journalist. Uh, uh, I know people don't like the use of the word climate, and I agree, but in any case, uh, then we have. Uh, uh, activists, NGO, advocacy people, like, so they all were interviewed about um, examples of this information, about how they're mobilized, about how they're, about funding, about, uh, you know, regulation, about different types of area, of areas. So we have that, they discussed in our coding by the research about how, how the trust actually go through, like, everything, hopefully we, we're going to do that, uh, but, and it's available to, uh, to people in a way, like we anonymized and, and all that. Now, 
In terms of also because of the institute funding, we go um, and uh, we bought historical data from the two uh, from the weeks of the COP26 um, and the research assistant uh, to help us. Now this uh, kind of uh, hashtags and um, hashtags and handles were specifically uh, chosen, right? Um, and some of them are um, uh, what we call the steam tanks, right? That are a bit kind of doing their thing. So we deliberately included them as well. Uh, and then some of the key hashtags, uh, climate action now, uh, climate change. Also, we, cho we chose some um, uh, climate hoax, you know, some disinformation type of hashtags as well, right? Um, and that was uh, for the two periods. That First of October 2021, 13th of November 2021, which was the COP26. Uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna show very, very quickly, and I'm gonna finish like that, uh, some of the of, of the things that we found. Um, so, um, so we have a dominant actor, of course, Greta Thunberg, is right up there. Uh, ben Phillips had to find equality, and then Channel 4 correspondent, um, Karen Jenkins there, uh, some, some examples. Uh, then we have um, positive and negative kind of like sentiment overview. Uh, we've got emotions overview. And then, um, so where are they from? So you have the dominant one is a male from London, United Kingdom. Um, and then you have audience analysis. Uh, so here you have like, um, where so, so on the on the Twitter where like in your bio where, where you are like when it's evident and then you have uh, the majority is from uh, forty percent from United Kingdom and you have United States which is very interesting the the the, the cousins and the special relationship whatever and then you have uh, the big big dominance of, of London there and then you have like some emoji that we used and and then of course uh, the words climate change, Glasgow leaders, blah, 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 like, and then you can see that in a tree map. Now, this one is about uh, negative, um, about uh, so the uh, negative, neutral, and um, kind of positive. So the green is the positive, then you have a neutral, and then you have a negative, and the crisis, emergency, whatever. It gets a little bit more interesting, and I'm going to go faster uh, when it's, uh, you know, like uh, in terms of the topics, and then you have like um, analysis, what are the, in terms of uh, semantic analysis, like what are the dominant kind of things, um, the topics, so sustainable development, climate change, education is what's happening there. And then you have uh, not the sentiment, but the, the, the emotions. And here you can see um, uh, fear, sadness, anger, whatever, that kind of thing. And then you can see what David Underdraw, like sort of, recognizing names are actually um, uh, how do you say, dominating the debate. Uh, then you have uh, a very discussed, right? The discussed there for the Conservative Party. Okay? <laughs> and then uh, you have uh, Joy somehow, but uh, uh, like G20, but the teacher of Bellion is also Joy in Green, the National Alliance and so on um, and so forth. And then in terms of content, there are certain things that, that really jump out, um, certain subjects that we know what they are. But what is interesting, and I, and I want you to take this on board, is that the one that you link to, right, is the most dominant one. But then what have you got? We have YouTube, The Guardian, you know, like, so you have like a domination, as I'm trying to say, or Mirror and the BBC, and so on, of, of mainstream media are still very important. They are the, the most, uh, uh, the, the, the websites that people share most. And then you have influencers, um, the most dominant ones, uh, who they are. So we have that information, sorry. Um, and then you have that by uh, impression, influences analysis, Greta Thunberg, of course, way up there, Ben Phyllis, et cetera, et cetera. And we can see, like for each one of those, okay, but I won't bore you, like what is happening in each one. And I'm sorry, I might have taken a little bit uh, longer than I should have, but it was a little bit, uh, um, a, a lot of, to go through. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, 
that was excellent. A, a huge amount of information. And thank you so much. That was an incredible um, uh, seminar. Thank you. Um, so uh, really, it's time for questions before we wait for a drink at three o'clock. Um, so over to the floor if anyone has a question for Athena. Anything? Yeah, I, I have a question at the beginning when you spoke about the optimistic versus pessimistic views. Uh -huh. In the pessimistic, there was the creation of knowledge gaps. I can really see the spread of misinformation or disinformation, but how can social media create a knowledge gap? Um, right. Uh, okay, so I think that, okay, that's a very, very different question. I think what this refers to is about, first of all, we have, okay, I'll start it differently. Like until the pandemic, let's say, right, uh, you would have uh, knowledge production inequalities anyway, or you know why, it's been the reasons where you have the knowledge producing the global north, and in fact, the global south is using, you know, science, techniques, education from the global north for a very long period of time, right? And, and in 2000, uh, 2000, that period that when you have like um, the first, sort of, from the mid 90s, the mid, mid 90s, when you have really big activism, like kind of like starting, then you have 9 11, you have the movement, you have the globalization movement, you have a lot of things happen in that regard. So you, can, you see that there is a criticism about that, right? probably starting in the 80s, I think also with people about intersectionality and culture, all that kind of stuff. Now, in our area, which is what we're doing here, right, this knowledge gap, um, it does, I don't think it refers to the, it, to the general kind of story, right, of, of science production, knowledge production, whatever. Uh, what probably I think it refers to is how this then might be reproduced online. So if you have like, what are the organizations, if you take Twitter, right? And what you are seeing and the debate about filter bubbles and eco changes and all that kind of thing, it means uh, frankly that it is different where a, a scientist and they don't usually want to do that because of lack of time and lack of um, uh, like the sometimes aggressive, the personal aggressive style of Twitter or other social media, they don't want to go there, they don't want to sign or they don't want it, right? But those that do, uh, it's like science production, right? It is by, it's like, it's dominated by Anglo-Saxon uh, global, like not in all areas. I mean, now we see in AI, like right, the time is kind of like going like this, and you don't know, have a lot. Yeah, anyway, that's another matter. So I think that it is more about that kind of like what dominates um, science about environmental communication, how then this might be reproduced uh, who are the dominant actors? So what when we talk about we saw from Twitter, right? Mainstream media is like is still there, and then you have certain actors that are far more dominant than others. And and these actors, you know, it's not that, for example, it's not that Uganda it might be producing on the on the Instagram. It might have like ten images, and the Bristol has like two hundred. Like it's also about production, right? Not, not just like actual production right, of, of um, activist uh, material uh, that is more from the global north than the global south. Right? So the knowledge gap is not just about the science and who dominates, it's about the material, the content, what is happening and the power that, the, that the, inside an activist organization, who are the more powerful individuals and where are the base, right? so this is a, that kind of thing, if it makes any sense. So I see, is, is a great question to unpack because there's a lot going on in, in this, right? So, yeah. That's fine. Uh, when you mentioned that there was, uh, oftentimes there was an event that activated individuals to take up digital communications for the purpose, whether that's Black Lives Matter or XR, did you see that sort of activism act as itself sort of self-replicating event that it could draw in more people to the movement by just protests and the visibility of them. So like, there was a participant that specifically talked about that, that um, 
he was he was a Londoner, he was passing through, uh, like saw what was going on, got interested, and then he went to a talk. Like it was like through being exposed to uh, sort of the, the demonstration and what was going on, uh, that, that they were influenced. But um, I don't think it's, uh, it's only like a serendipity kind of lack of them that, oh, I'm bumped into this and I want to know what it is. And I think it is also peers, it's also family. Um, we have the students from um, uh, UK, uh, 16 or 17, uh, like he talked about how he went with two other families, so three families together to the People's March against the uh, Brexit. So how the social life, like through their family, they want to do that or how the school, for some reason, like through other things that are different. The triggering events, now the triggering events are very interesting because in the cases there were violent events. Um, and what I mean is like there was a lot about policing and also the killing of activists, uh, like, uh, you know, homophobia, like people's brutality, all that kind of stuff that triggered or like this sort of uh, far-right golden dawn one that I just mentioned, like they went to the protest during the trial and, you know, there was a lot of engagement that triggered trauma. There was a policing kind of uh, brutality event, and, and then they went out and, and found, they, they took the children with them. So, you have like a, a little child holding a packet saying the parks are for playing in Greece, not for to get picked up, right? So, so there is, I think the cigarette events are important because they, they show that the historical, political, economic context, and so on is, is very important. Um, so, this is a technology, but uh, but, but it influences what kind of digital citizen you get. And not only that, but uh, how uh, governments and corporates do the digital in this country influences as well. So it is not just, you know, interview people. They do talk about how I became activist with the because I was sick of um, kind of like food banks in this country and inequality and so on and so forth. Right? So you can see like the rationale always will go back to something that triggered them right? in some respect. Does anyone else have a question? I have a very brief question for you. Yes, go on. Yeah, um, the things I would like to know more about is that, that how are you considering your research, the companies that count the, the social media? Because I believe that probably they have a huge influence in the environment, the, the natural environment, it changes a lot in the time. And probably this has some impact on the content that people are producing. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what discipline are you from? Uh, forestry. Forestry, okay. Uh, geography. Geography, yeah. Uh, okay, right. Um, no, I'm asking because uh, I'm asking so how to kind of like uh, address your question, mm -hmm. right? So I think there is like what I would, I would say superficial research that is um, superficial in the sense that yes, everybody can say bad, bad tech company uh, and, and why surveillance capitalism and no offense, but it's kind of like this kind of bad, bad tech company, but it's platform, right? And how actors move from platform to platform to do, let's say, this information. So they will start, let's say, from Reddit, that's there, go to Facebook, go to Twitter, go to YouTube. In Twitter, they might be appearing like, for instance, um, balanced, right? Uh, but then they will uh, direct you to a YouTube link that is very, uh, uh, you know, like far right or whatever else, right? And there's a rabbit hole then that you follow. So there is a multi-platform. This is a multi-platform uh, phenomenon. That we're talking about. So, of course, the the data governance, the algorithmic governance, and the broader digital governance of the platform does affect affect right what what activists can do on the platform. Absolutely. For example, we had a participant that said, "Oh, we unmasked a fake XR account uh, on Twitter." But the next thing you know, they reported us like fake reporting on Facebook, and Facebook shut us down. So all the work we have done, right, right. Now you can say, of course, it's a problem because if you report somebody that we know this, like the, with Facebook about transparency reports, from more problems on moder call the moderation and who's doing call the moderation, but often it's precarious uh, workers from the global south, etc., etc. So, um, so it's a very uh, so yes, it depends. But the interesting thing, uh, it depends. The the governance scheme of the platform is very important. 
But what is more interesting is how activists are navigating this. Uh, what, what I was showing you that they say, okay, WhatsApp is no longer safe, we're going to go to Signal, Telegram, or whatever. Or they're thinking, well, what a waste of time being on Facebook because you're going to get shut down. Maybe we should invest in something else. Or uh, activists would say, uh, actually, we don't want to be on Facebook. We, we're using Facebook only to attract older people because it's the old people are there. Uh, or now with the Twitter kind of Elon Musk uh, takeover, right? You have like uh, people living it and not living it and all that kind of stuff. It's a bit like Brexit and <laughs> the other way around. So for me, what is interesting is the interplay of where activists are doing what and why, which has to do with what you, you asked about, right? But the second more interesting thing is how the platform governance, let's put it broadly, right? Um, uh, is in dialectic with governments, national governments and their digital policies. Now, both national governments, but also at the commission level, what actions like this are services act, the European Democracy Action <coughs> Plan, all that that is happening in the Commission, and particularly what they're trying to do with, um, for instance, recently, and in this country was an online harms bill that, uh, that was actually uh, circulated and we advised on uh, as well. But you can see that there is um, the, the governments and the and the corporates. Are in public, that pretended that they are at odds with each other. Oh, they didn't give us this. We asked them, you know, bad Facebook. We are the police. We didn't give it that, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Or it's their fault, you know. A platform would say it's the government's fault because, you know, what happened in, you know, with what is called the Facebook genocide in Nigeria. Like, there's a lot of issues there on that interplay and how they're pretending that they're odds. But actually, there are many, many instances where they actually collaborate and they consider themselves. Uh, global passive networks and so on and so forth. Now, there's a very long, I've written a bit about that, it's a long discussion. I agree, but you, you have to see it in a kind of more nuanced way than that, that, that there's a lot about that platform. There's a lot going on, especially in places like India or China, right? and, and what, what the dialectic there uh, between platform and government is quite kind of uh, important. You can't just say, but, but government, but, but company right because this is not uh cool uh, no okay well thank you very much i think we'll um, wrap things up there a bit three o'clock and i know that some people have got to run ahead of other commitments thank you so much athena thank you and uh just apologies the room wasn't a bit warmer than it is <laughs> okay, i can prepare it yeah you're not prepared. Prepared. <laughs> i know this <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to learn faster thank you very much